Good morning, everyone. This is Tim Selden, president of the Monastery Foundation, and with me is Dr. Anita Amos. Anita? Hi. Yes. Um, great to be here, and with me as well is my husband, Robert Amos. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today. And we appreciate everybody. There's about 100 of you with us at this point, and uh, this is the fourth in our series of five webinars about parent communication, uh, record keeping, using a tool like Monastery Compass to really bring the message of the intangible home. So um, we'll get started. And uh, let me just explain the basic ground rules for any of you who haven't been part of it before. The first is we are recording this. And at the end of the session, assuming all goes well, I'll convert the recording, I'll upload it, and as soon as it's there, I'll send out a link to you all to the two parts. Each webinar is two hours long. We like to stop every 20 minutes or so to encourage you to do a yoga posture or run in place or lay down in savasana, if you know what that is, or hug your dog or get up and get a cup of tea, whatever works for you. Um, we'll also have a few polls, which are intended just to be a small break. Um, this is not the end. There's going to be another webinar, and I'll tell you right now, it's going to be at the same time, same place, but it's going to be this coming Friday. Regardless of whether you're able to participate live, you are welcome to participate virtually. And the um, online versions of the webinars are going to be there indefinitely. You're welcome to share them with friends if you want. And I should remind you that there are continuing education units available for any of you who participate in all five of them. Um, and even if you didn't do it all live, if you swear to us and the Sarasota Technical Institute that you really did do all five and you feel that you've earned one continuing education unit or CEU, you can go ahead and get that through uh, Sarasota County Technical Institute. Um, we're going to get started and I'm going to ask uh, Anita to switch to the next slide because I want to review what we're doing this week. Now, I want to again tell you that all of you are currently on mute. Um, there is a little panel at the bottom of your screen, if this is your first time using GoToWebinar, where you can type a message to me. Um, there's also another one midway up where you can ask questions. It really doesn't matter which way you communicate, whether it's through the chat or through questions. Every so often, I'll stop and I'll ask Rob or Anita to um, answer questions, or if I can, I'll answer them. And I want you to get the bigger picture. The Monastery uh, Foundation is your host. Um, this is about a separate uh, software solution called Monastery Compass. We've been in collaboration with two wonderful Monastery parents, Rob and Anita Amos, who founded Monastery Compass for the better part of two years now. Essentially, what they did is they developed a software solution that if they hadn't done it, we would have had to go out and raise the money to do it for the Montessori community. There's been a number of solutions that are out there. There's different things that work for different people. We felt that the existing solutions really were not meeting all the needs that were really critical. We feel that in Montessori Compass, we are well on the way to producing a, forgive me, world-class Montessori school record-keeping administration and communication tool. And I hope you end up agreeing with me, but the bottom line is we believe this is important regardless of how you do it. It is no longer an option to not keep records and to not communicate to parents. So what are we going to do this week? Well, last week we started part one. This week we're going to review a few of the things we talked about last week. We're going to review the importance of parent communication for Montessori schools. <clears throat> We're going to review what the goals are of communicating with parents. What are you trying to achieve? We're going to review how Montessori Compass's communication center 
gets the job done and how you can use it in different ways according to your preference and style. And we're going to review something we went into last week, which is the daily or weekly activity reports, which really impresses an awful lot of people. It also intimidates a fair number of Montessori teachers, and we'll try to talk about that as well. Then we're going to move into three new areas this week. One is what a parent sees, such as email notifications on Montessori Compass. By the way, MC is uh, Nita's and Rob's uh, initials for Montessori Compass. We're going to talk about trackers, a little-known aspect of Montessori Compass that is very powerful and which if you didn't really know about it, you probably would never use it to its potential. A lot of schools are very pleased with the fact that it does that. And then finally, we're going to talk about the major progress reports. We're actually going to add in a little bit more, and I'm not quite sure where Rob and Anita are going to want me to put it, but I'm going to talk about some of the things the Montessori Foundation is bringing to the table. In addition to coming originally with our scope and sequence and the work that we've been doing over many years, and which they've added to tremendously, it's been a real collaboration, but we are also bringing a lot of resources that you may be familiar with and many new ones that we're creating. Um, so I'm going to be talking about everything we're going to do to try to make your family's experience with Montessori Compass a real extension of your school, a real outreach of what it feels like to be engaged in a highly intensive parent support, parent question and answer, parent education, parent insights program. So that's our goal for this particular week. <sighs> Take a breath, Tim. What I want to do now is I want to talk to you about something I mentioned last week, and we're going to use the same silly little cartoon. Parent communication. The average parent cannot put their finger on what their children are getting out of their years with you. Montessori and your school scare the average parent to death because they're not sure that one day their child will not get into the college of her choice and she'll say to them, if only you hadn't sent me to that monastery school, I would have been just fine. So lots and lots of us say to parents things like, trust us, it's all going to be fine. We don't believe in standardized testing. We don't believe in, in homework. We don't believe in, in weekly reports. There's a lot of things that we don't do that other schools do do. If you've got a child at almost any public school in the nation, there's probably a software tool where tonight's homework is posted, where your child's grades up to the minute are posted, where any kind of incident reports are posted for you to see privately. And the average parent, if anything, is really being facilitated and encouraged in their helicopter behavior. Montessori, we don't want to do that. On the other hand, as my son Mark likes to say, we are really playing Russian roulette. Families want to know. Now, there are plenty of parents who say, Rob, Anita, Tim, Gertrude, we trust you. That's not the average parent that I've met in Montessori schools, and I suspect it's not the average of what you see. What they want to know is probably more intense and controlling. They want to know how their, is their child on grade level? Will he be able to get into the gifted and talented program? What are the standardized test scores as compared with last year? A whole bunch of stuff that we just don't necessarily agree with. We have to communicate with parents. That doesn't mean that we have to be just like every other school. What we really have as a challenge is we don't use tests normally, and if we do, it's rare. It's typically not something that's going home every week, that's for sure. Most of us don't really have homework, certainly not what most schools call homework, five or six hours of paperwork and workbooks a week or an hour for every grade level the child is. Most of us are not using letter grades, and most of us don't really have honor rolls. We don't believe in that kind of thing. 
And I suggest that we're right to not believe in that. But that doesn't mean that we can just walk away and say it's okay. It's not okay. Next slide, Anita. So, in general, I usually talk about as walking the razor's edge. On the one hand, we want our parents to know that we're trying to find the switch that will excite a child to the depth of her soul. We want to pursue all of her interests. We want to allow her to run with ideas instead of just doing what we tell her to do. We're looking for active learners instead of passive ones, as Montessori once wrote. On the other hand, we live in a country. I don't care if your country is mainland China or the Republic of Korea, or whatever it is. You've got a national curriculum or a state curriculum or a county curriculum. And there are expectations that are pretty widely understood of what a child in your country is expected to know at a particular time. Now, you can get crazy about that and literally say, on this day, this is where the whole class should be. I'm not imagining anything like that. But we don't go to the other extreme either of just saying, go forth, children. God bless you. Write if you ever get work. Let us know if you ever learn to read. We walk a razor's edge. We've we do not want to micromanage our children's learning, and we certainly don't want to turn learning into a chore. On the other hand, we've got to have something in mind. I just got an email yesterday from one of our schools that we work with in Bermuda. And this incredibly bright, talented coordinator said, are there any standards in Montessori? And the answer, of course, is, yeah, there are standards. The question is, what happens if a child doesn't meet the standard? Nothing bad. We certainly don't fail him. We don't tell him he's a dummy. We don't reject him. We don't bring him up in front of the class and humiliate him. And so the question is, what do standards mean? Well, you've got to have some idea of what you would expect a child to know before she moves from early childhood or CASA or primary, whatever word you use for it, to the lower elementary level. Again, whatever word you use to describe that. You may or may not say if a child doesn't meet all those expectations, we're going to hold you back for the gift of a fourth year. By the way, I'm a great believer in the gift of a fourth year. There are children who really aren't ready to move up. But it usually isn't their academics. It's that they're emotionally and socially. They're just not really ready for the climate of the next classroom. But we still have to have some idea of what it is we think children should be able to do. Next slide. Thank you, Nita. Some of you may have seen this last time. This is an image of the way I think of the tapestry of our curriculum. It's only one way of framing it. I should have added in my spiral of Montessori studies. But the basic idea on this picture is everything's interconnected. There's lots of different pieces to Montessori. Art, music, theater, Physical science, earth science, computer literacy, math, geometry, trade, economics, architecture, technology, and invention, lots of different things. And there are big sweeping questions. How did we all get to be here? What is kind in the world? Is humanity, is humanity inherently violent? Are boys and girls really the same? Why are some people poor? Is there such a thing as injustice in the world? Those are all what we call meta-narratives, big picture issues. And those issues, those big picture issues are incredibly important. And we don't teach things in isolation. We teach as if everything is connected to everything else. One other point is children are moving 
not as a herd. They're moving as individuals. You may give a lesson to the whole class or to a subgroup of the class, but the difference is that from the time you present something to a child and the time when the child really knows it, knows it well enough that she doesn't forget it over Christmas break, doesn't forget it over the summer, can actually teach it to someone else, can design a way of testing someone else to see if they know this particular thing or how to do this thing. That level of knowledge happens in its own time. That doesn't mean we just turn kids loose and let them go at their own pace without any, even attempting to pay attention. Obviously, we're guides. We're guides. And sometimes guides say, you know, we really need to, to move along here. Night is falling. You don't want to be caught out here on this exposed plateau on a cold winter's note, night. You know, or I really need for you to let me give you a lesson to show you how to do this. We call ourselves monastery guides for a reason. And whether you use the term directress, guide, facilitator, teacher, or some other term, it doesn't matter. A monastery teacher is not insisting that every child be the same and every child be at the same place at the same time. But we are paying attention. We have to know what we've presented and what our children actually understand and what our children are remembering, what they can do in real time, actually apply it in the real world. And we want to know how they understand it. How all of this happens will be the subject of still another series of webinars that we're planning for you all. But for the moment, just take my word for it, we've got to track it, and I think you know that too. So, Anita, let's move on to the next slide. So, Anita, remind me, is this one me or you? This is me. I, I know now. This is me. So. That's right. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, here I want to start by just reiterating something that I experienced in January. My um, almost, second to youngest daughter is Chelsea Howe. Chelsea has two beautiful kids, and in the middle of last January, her caregiver, for whatever reason, left on very short notice. And all of a sudden, she's got a 10-week-old child and an 18-month-old child and no one to care for them. Chelsea is a psychologist, and she works for the Monastery Foundation, and some of you have seen things she's written. Chelsea was in a scramble, and so we made a bunch of calls to the Washington area, and we finally found one of our friends who had room for both children. Ten weeks old. Can you imagine that? So the first day, Chelsea calls her mom and I up, and she's absolutely ecstatic. And this is somebody who hangs around Montessori schools all the time, who has been out in the field and done consulting and spoken to schools ad nauseum, and was a Montessori child herself. What really thrilled her was within an hour of dropping her children off, the teachers sent her a picture of each of the kids with a very short note. Hudson's having a great morning. You know, Jackson has already got five girlfriends who just adore him. And every day or so, Chelsea gets something from the school, telling them just a little bit what exactly is going on with her kids. It's not a big fancy report. I've talked to her teachers. I assure you it doesn't take them more than 60 seconds to write it. They do it while the kids are napping or sometime where they get a quick break, and they do it really fast. And it's about as difficult to do as your kids find it to upload a picture to Facebook. It is that easy. It absolutely blew Chelsea and Mark away. And it's exactly the kind of thing that we mean by engagement. Part of what Montessori Compass in is is a container 
for the scope and sequence that we collaborated to produce. Part of it is the alignment to the common core standard so that if you care about such things or if somebody demands the information from you, you're going to be able to show what your children are doing compared against the national common core standards. Now, we don't like that. We don't like big government. We don't like government interference with schools. So please don't hear me as having just sold out to the world of big government, big education. On the other hand, parents need to know. And it's I think it's a, a mistake to hide from it. So while I would never teach to those standards, anyone that's running a good Montessori classroom will normally meet and exceed those standards just by doing pure Montessori. So if you wanted to focus on those standards, you could, but for most of us, we only look once a year, if that often. You want to engage your parents, and engaging your parents is a lot of things. It's the little things like uh, the school does that uh, Hudson and Jackson go to, sending little notes home. It's sending home notes about the things that children are learning in school um, and sending it in a way that is hard for a parent to miss and easy for them to digest. You want to engage them. Your parents essentially are divided into at least three groups. There's the scanners who look at things and in 30 seconds they're done. And whatever they got out of it, they got out of it. There's the, what I call the three-minute reader, the people who scan it more carefully, do a little reading. They look at the headlines. They look at the captions, and they scan over the body text. And they get a pretty good idea of what's in there. And then there's the three-hour reader, the parent who's willing to put in the time and the effort to really go through line by freaking line. And those people are awake, and they are paying attention. By the way, those are typically the most engaged parents we get. So what we would suggest to you is you want to write in a way that parents Oh dear, 
I accidentally muted myself. Can you all hear me now, I hope? Um, I don't know what you heard or didn't hear. Uh, goodness gracious, I'm not sure what you missed, folks. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm going to ask if someone would type to give me a sense of what you heard last. I'm getting lots of people. Sonia is telling me my Internet's down. Thank you, Sonia. Shelly, too. Everyone. I don't know what I did that did that. So I was down for about two minutes. I will... Anita, did I did it go down while I was on this slide? Okay. Well, I guess the good news is no, there is no good news because if you couldn't hear it, it's not being recorded. So let me just pick up then with what I said, and I do apologize, everybody. I don't know how I managed to do that. Um, the things that I think are really important is that we have to. Remember, our parents are very, very busy, that they have little time, they're being inundated with emails, and that your parents are made up of at least three completely different kind of people. You've got the people that will read every single thing you send at them, and they'll underline it, and they'll ask questions, and they'll keep throwing more at you. Then you've got parents who will scan it quickly, and you've got people who will just sort of notice it, or not notice it, and it's not at all important to them. So you've got to do whatever you can to grab people's attention. And that's part of it. And we're going to be building an awful lot of information in. And boy, to have you guys help me out here. I'm looking at so many text messages. Thank you. I'm sorry, everyone. Okay, Anita, if you can still hear me, um, go on to the next one. So I think now we're starting to get into you. You or Rob? Who's coming on? Yeah, hi, hi, Tim. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Amos. I'm one of the co-founders of Monastery Compass, along with my wife, Anita. Thanks, everyone, for joining us here today. And thank you, Tim, for the introduction there. Um, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. We'll do a real quick uh, recap on some of the uh, parent communication features we were discussing. And then we're going to move forward with some of the more automated um, parent communication um, features that we have available to us here today. Um, so last week we were talking about the idea that um, we're really fortunate in Monastery Compass to work with schools from, from all over the world. And we've really learned um, and grown to, appreciate, uh, grown to really appreciate the fact that there's really no one-size-fits-all approach to running a school. Everybody has their own way of doing things. And our philosophy is to make sure that we're building software that can really um, really be customized and um, and can adapt to meet the needs of your uh, specific school. So all the communication features we discussed last week as well as what we're discussing this week can all be customized and modified to meet your very specific needs. Um, we talked a lot about the communication center in the application where you can go ahead and determine who can send messages and what, what, what type of information appears on a calendar and um, how do you go ahead and set up email notifications that can serve to remind parents to log in when new information is present. Where we left off was with the activity reports feature. This is one of those features that, like what Tim was saying earlier on, um, where you know some some schools are real excited about this and our schools are very nervous about this feature. I can assure you that activity reports are an optional feature. You do not have to use it. We have many schools who start using Montessori Compass and they work with just the record keeping and the administrative side of things to kind of keep th keep track of things internally and they gradually turn on some of the parent communication features as they get more comfortable. Other schools just jump right on in and start using the parent communication tools right away. The activity reports, what they are, is either a daily or a weekly summary of a child's activity in the classroom. It includes three key components. One, the academic summary. It's basically what was the child doing today academically? What record keeping was actually recorded um, you know, during the child's work time? Uh, that would also include a link to get more information about that with our parent-friendly descriptions and photos, which we were showing you last week, and I'll show you again this week. It also includes trackers. 
Trackers are a feature we're going to spend a bit of time speaking about today that can re that really kind of puts that philosophy of the no one size fits all approach really into action where you can create a tracker category for anything. Anything that you want to keep track of, whether it's something that's related to the classroom, something that's related to um, school administrators, um, something that's, you know, anything you can possibly manage, you can create that, and then you can choose to share with parents or to not share it with parents. And then lastly, it includes notes or observations shared by the teacher in the classroom. You can share general notes or general observations with everybody or you can share um, anecdotal or private notes with individual parents. Um, so um, you can determine when the activity report is sent out by uh, setting up your email notification send time. So in this example here, we strongly advise you choose daily email notifications to nudge parents, to remind them to log in to Montessori Compass because there's something new for them to look at. And then you determine the time of day most people choose a uh, time that coincides with the end of the school day, whether it's 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. or what have you. And then what will happen is, in this example, at 6 p.m., the system is going to go ahead and scan itself, and it's going to look for anything new. It's going to start off in the, in, the, in the record keeping and say, you know, has there been any new record keeping um, entries recorded for a child? Has there been any uh, parent communication observations that were shared? Were there any trackers shared? If, any of the, if the answer to any of those questions is yes, it'll generate one of these activity reports. If the answer is no, then an activity report will not be generated. So we don't send out blank reports. We only send out something when there's something, something new to share. And then it'll also go ahead and look for new messages and new calendar events and new photos. And it'll send a nice summary to the parents to let them know that they need to log into Montessori Compass. The types of customization that you have here are um, you can choose a daily summary or a weekly summary. And then you can choose to include record keeping. Or we have some schools who don't wish to include record keeping. You can turn that off. And then what would happen is it'll only share the observations from the teachers, but it won't actually share the record keeping. Um, so you have that option as well. It's important to note you also see the option of none on there. All of the parent communication is set to none by default. So out of the box, we do not share anything with parents. You have to choose to make a decision whether or not you want to share, and that's an administrator level feature only, and someone with administrator level credentials can go ahead and decide what they want to do here in terms of setting up the parent communication. Um, so what we're looking at here is the parent communication tab on the daily dashboard. If you were a current Montessori Compass customer or a new customer or participated in one of our other webinars, um, you probably know that most of the action in Monastery Compass, so it's a very big system with a lot of moving parts, that most of the action really occurs in the daily dashboard. That's where all the data is entered from the classroom, whether it's record keeping or attendance or observations and so forth. What we're looking at is the parent communication tab, which is this is how you would share a brief note with a parent. Um, you could write something simple like, Teresa, she had a great day, she was very busy and focused, she spent a lot of time in the math area, and so forth. Or you could say, you know, hey, don't forget to turn in the uh, permission slip for the uh, field trip tomorrow, or hey, you have an overdue library uh, book, please send it back, or thanks for volunteering at the book fair yesterday, we really appreciate it. Any sort of brief comments that you wish to share with the parents, this is a very convenient way to go ahead and do that. Um, and it also is in, um, serves, uh, what we're looking at here really kind of serves as a preview view uh, for what an activity report is going to look like because this contains all of the data. So not only do you have the observation here or the comment that the teacher wants to share, but you also have a list of all the lessons that were recorded. <clears throat> so um, in the case of Teresa, we can see that she uh, was recorded as having worked with the sandpaper numerals the numeral cards and counters, and the zero game. So those three lessons, if we're using activity reports, are going to be shared with the parents. If it's a daily activity report, they'll be shared later today. If you uh, have a weekly report, this will be included on the weekly report, which will be sent out on Friday. Um, 
if you wish to turn off one of these, so let's just say maybe there's an unusual situation where the child has worked with the sandpaper numerals every day for the past two weeks, and you, for some reason you just don't want to go ahead and share that with them again. I can go ahead and, uh, and, un and, ch and hit the check mark there and unselect that, and that would manually turn off the sandpaper numerals. It will still have been recorded and added to her record keeping, but we'll just, we just don't want to share it with the parents right now for whatever our reason is, so I can manually turn those off on an individual lesson basis. So you do have a lot of flexibility in that regard. Um, the note, it's important to note that the, um, where it says primary, that's the name of the classroom. And the note that you would, re would record there would be shared with everybody in the whole classroom. So it's not going to be practical for five days a week to write a private anecdotal note for every single child, you know, five days a week. But a really nice um, practice to consider implementing at your school is to spend a few moments at the end of your day, write a, a nice summary, a short, you know, brief summary as to uh, what was occurring in the classroom in that classroom box, and that'll go out to everybody on the activity report. Now, <clears throat> this is what the activity report looks like, and the red highlight indicates um, indicates the um, the academic summary. So th this is all of the um, all of the different lessons that were uh, recorded for her. So we can see the spindle boxes and matching picture to object and fabric boxes and so forth. Um, you can click on this link and you can go ahead and get more information about these lessons. Um, from a parent's perspective. Um, so there's a question. Question just asked, so is it not possible to turn off calendar updates but leave activity activity reports on? I mean, can I just send out activity reports notifications but not calendar? Um, so you can go ahead. I'm not entirely sure what you're referring to here. There's um, ways to customize what appears on the calendar and there's ways to customize what appears on the activity report. So let's let's go ahead and break those apart. First off, by default, when I'm doing my lesson planning um, and I plan a lesson in advance, whether it's a day in advance or a month in advance, a lesson that I would, uh, would go ahead and plan would um, automatically post to a classroom calendar which is shared with parents. In our communications center, we have the ability to turn that on or off. So um, if I want the parents to know what lessons we have, uh, we have scheduled for tomorrow, I can keep that turned on. If I don't want them to know what we're doing tomorrow, I can turn that off. With the activity reports, I can choose to share the record keeping that has occurred. Now we're in past tense. An activity report is saying what happened already. So we've gone ahead and turned that off. Um, so you have the ability to show show what, what has occurred in an activity report or to not show. Um, you also, what we're looking at right here is the notification that the parents receive. And um, this shows us here that the following updates have been posted in the past 24 hours. You have one new activity report. You have 13 new photos. You have a total of three new or unread messages. And then you have, here's the next uh, six events on your calendar over the next two weeks. So. These events have already been posted to the calendar, uh, but we're just reminding them that these events are coming up. These are not planned lessons. These are just regular um, school events on the calendar. Um, so getting back to um, to what we were saying with the, um, can you flip me? Uh, here's another question. We currently use the weekly report. Is there a way to have the comments and the communication be dated? As I understand right now, comments do not have a date attached. You can just simply go ahead and add a date to each comment if you want to say, you know, Monday dash and then have your comment, you know, Tuesday dash, Tuesday colon, whatever, that would be a way to do that. But these are just text boxes that will just go ahead and uh, you'll stack up all of your comments on the weekly report. Um, all right, so moving forward, um, so we were showing, <coughs> excuse me, this is where our activity um, activities that were uh, recorded um, are going to show up in this summary. If I go ahead and you see how it matches up, so in the, where we have James here in the red highlight, he worked with the spindle boxes, matching picture to object, fabric box, and nuts and bolts. I toggle back on over to the activity reports, and it's presented just like this. And then I also have the ability to click on the link that says information about these lessons, 
And this is where we get into some of our um, parent education here, the concept of educating the parent alongside the child. So James had these four lessons today, and we're letting the parent know what was involved with these lessons. As part of the scope and sequence that we make available from infant through age 12, we have um, parent-centric descriptions, and in some cases we have images that go along with them as well. These are not meant to be full presentations of the uh, lesson. These are meant to be uh, to, to just be a means of helping to educate the parent. Um, and uh, we specifically have photos uh, for the primary level in language, mathematics, practical life, and sensorial. Um, and we're working to add additional photos as well throughout elementary. So question, um, <clears throat> when and how do parents get notified if a calendar and entry was updated? So the um, calendar is going to be a, um, a uh, dynamic real-time update. So if you have an event that is um, scheduled for next Wednesday, and you changed it to next Thursday, when you make that change, it's updated in real time. So parents, sh parents should be encouraged to go ahead and always check the current calendar. You are able to print out a calendar as well, but it's really a much better practice to view it on the website so that way you have it, um, you know, have the most current information. Um, when the email notification is sent out, it would include the, you know, the current up-to-date calendar event. So if it was scheduled for Wednesday of next week and you change it to Thursday, you know, it'll be you know, the, the next time an email notification is sent out, that will be updated as well. All right. Um, <clears throat> so what we're looking at right now is, um, yeah, oh, these are the notes. Okay, so now we're talking specifically about the notes. We were talking about the concept of you can have a general classroom note in the classroom box and then a private or anecdotal note in the student box. And those appear down at the bottom of the activity report. So you see up at the, where it says notes, the first comment that we see is the, is the, is the classroom note that went out to everybody. So from a workflow standpoint, the teacher went in at the end of the day and just wrote a quick little note to go ahead and share with everybody. And then, so that's such a busy Friday. We spent a lot of time in the outdoor classroom today enjoying the beautiful weather. That note was written one time in the, in the classroom box and then was shared with all 20 students, whoever was, whoever was marked as present today. Um, the second note where it said James had a busy day, that is a private or anecdotal note and that is only shared with James's parents. Nobody else is able to see that note. And this is um, an example again of the email notification. We've talked about this. So now we're going to go ahead and move on to the idea of tracker. So a tracker is just a way to go ahead and, and keep track of any sort of administrative. Um, you, know, you know, Rob, before you go any further, take take a breath. Let's let everyone do a stretch before we get into trackers because we've been running for 40 minutes or so. Is that okay? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> hi, everyone. I see that I've got a few people have their hands raised. Is there anyone that's feeling that they would like to speak live? I see Christy, Patricia, and Vincent have their hands raised. Send me an instant message if you do want to have the floor, and I'll give it to you. And in the meantime, I've got a poll for you because polls are fun, right? So here's, here's a poll. And um, hopefully you'll all respond to that while you're taking a quick break. We're stretching. We're going to come back in a moment or two after you get your tea or coffee or water. And you can respond to the poll. Last week we were getting 20% voting every five seconds. It was amazing how fast you guys did it. We're up to 28% now. I should do a poll on how well is this working.
Okay, it looks to me like uh, voting seems to have stopped, so if there's anyone who's getting ready to do it, I encourage you to submit it in quickly. Otherwise, I'll close the poll and post the results. Yeah, seems pretty pretty stable. No one else doing anything. So I'm going to close the poll and I'll share the results. There you go. We are always evaluating our progress, their progress. 52% of us, that's terrific. 14% daily. Very interesting. And in the meantime, is there anyone who would like to... Um, have an opportunity to have the microphone and speak live. Well, I'll just do it randomly. Vincent Duffy, I hope you're there because I'm about to give you the microphone. Vincent, are you there? No, guess not. Nothing from Vincent. And I see a hand up from Patricia Egley. I'm not sure if Patricia still wants to speak, but you're going live. Patricia, are you there? Okay, are you there, team? Yeah. Hi, how are you? Well, I'm just fascinated by this way of uh, having this opportunity of learning new things. I'm glad. So did you have a question you wanted to ask? Not anymore. You have already answered it as far as uh, uh, you were speaking. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So there you go. And it looks to me like that's all we had as far as questions for right now. So, um, oh, and I see Patricia sent me a note. Thank you, Patricia. I'm sorry I didn't see that. Um, so I'm going to close the poll. This will, of course, be in the video, I believe. Um, and we'll move on. Rob, you uh, ready to continue onward? I am, Tim. Thanks. Um, I'm thoroughly stretched and hydrated, so uh, let's see if my voice will hang in there. Um, so we're going to talk about the trackers um, a little bit more in, uh, in uh, detail. So it's a real versatile feature that is just great tool for uh, school administrators to go ahead and keep track of um, any sort of paperwork you might need to keep track of, enrollment form, tuition information, um, any of the sort of day-to-day -day things that you might need in the office. In the classroom for teachers, you can use it to keep track of, you know, for the younger uh, children, you know, naps and meals and uh, diaper and toilet training uh, activities, any sort of um, classroom projects or crafts or permission slips and so forth. So there's a lot of flexibility for this, um, for this uh, particular feature. So to go ahead and create your trackers, you'll want to go into your backpack and you click on the trackers link down there. And then you'll be presented with your uh, tracker categories. You can click on any of the categories to open that. You can see the number of trackers and then whether or not a specific category is shared with parents. So I can see with that first one, diaper and toilet training, it says four trackers and it says shared with parents. Uh, that means that anything I put into that category can be shared with the parents via the activity report, the daily or weekly activity report. The second category says enrollment forms. It also says four trackers, but it does not say shared with parents. So that means anything I put there is just for internal use. Um, so when I create a new tracker category, I go ahead and give it a name. I then check off the box whether or not I wish to go ahead and share with parents. That is optional. By default, it is not shared with parents. And then when I create it, then I create my individual trackers um, underneath each category. Um, when I go ahead and uh, want to start tracking these in th this information, I click on trackers in my daily dashboard. Again, that's the central hub that you would uh, be using throughout the day. And let's say I want to keep track of a meal. Um, I would go ahead and do a search for my different trackers. 
I select the tracker I'm interested in and then I will go ahead and be presented with a list of all the students. If this is a um, a, um, a tracker that is going to be used on multiple occasions like naps and meals and kind of everyday types of things, you'll get um, whether or not it's been tracked before and the number of times. If it's a one-time use tracker like a permission uh, slip for a field trip or something, you can very see, very easily see at a glance who's uh, turned in the permission slip and who has not. So you would then simply tap on the child's name and then uh, that person is now tracked for that. And then back to the parent communication tab in our dashboard, you can see a list of all the trackers that were reported today. Again, this, this provides a nice preview screen for a teacher or administrator to view the data that you're about to share on a daily or weekly activity report. So if you want to make changes, if you want to unshare a tracker, just like we, I showed you, you can unshare an individual lesson. You can check that box, <coughs> excuse me, uncheck a box, and that will go ahead and unshare the tracker. Um, and then this is how it's displayed to parents. I have a trackers um, section there in the middle, and then there's my category, there's my individual trackers, and then you can also comment on trackers. Um, we work with a lot of schools that have paper templates, um, paper documents, uh, especially for the younger classrooms. And there's, um, you know, a pre-formatted template for, you know, naps. I had a great nap today. I had a, I had an average nap, or I, I, I wasn't interested in napping today. You know, those sorts of things. Same applies to meals or feelings and mood and, um, you know, diaper and potty training and things like that. So there's a lot of kind of paper templates that we've seen that schools use. You can duplicate exactly what you're already doing on paper with these trackers. And a big difference is um, you're sharing it with parents right there in real time. And then you also have a historical log. So you can go back into, I need to know whether or not the child took a nap three months ago. I mean, you would have that data. You have everything that you ever tracked. Um, you know, since the beginning of school, so it's a real nice way to just to just to keep track of everything. And in, in the event of a rainy day, and you need that information, you always have it. Um, and then you can go ahead and share whatever comments. And some of the stuff is very relevant from a parent's perspective. Things like whether or not the child's eating their lunch. This is a good way to share that information. What kind of a nap the child had. I'm a parent of four children, and I can think of, you know, when, when my younger ones have gone to school, do you want to know whether or not they had that nap today? Because if they didn't have that nap, you know, look out at dinner time. They're going to be, you know, climbing up on the table. So, um, you know, it's a really good information to be able to share this information with, uh, with uh, parents. Um, moving forward here, we're going to get into progress reports, but this is... Um, Another good kind of break point if there was any questions about trackers before I move forward here. <laughs> well, let's so see if there's, let's see if there are any questions. Uh, one person is asking if there's a spell check, Rob. Um, yeah, so spell check, we don't have spell check specifically in the application, but you would have it in your browser. Um, so Chrome, Firefox, whatever browser you're using should have a reasonable spell check. I'm a big, uh, big fan of Chrome myself, so whether you're using a Mac or a PC, um, it works just tremendously. It also translate, by the way. We work with, uh, I just got, um, a uh, support ticket from a school in Chile um, a couple of days ago, and it was all written in uh, Espanol, and uh, I was able to go ahead and uh, translate that instantly using Google Chrome. So that's just another tip outside of what we're talking about here, but uh, that would uh, that would have spell check for you. Another question that people ask that I know the answer to is: Does the information carry over from year to year? Yeah, you, you, you keep a, you, you keep historical access to everything. You don't have to delete any students. If you have students who have moved on, you can archive students and keep all their information in the event you need it. So this really does serve from a year-to-year -year, um, um, perspective. I mean, this basically is going to turn into a big, giant filing cabinet for you for you know all your student records. I know different states here in the U.S. have different requirements. I'm sure different countries have different requirements for... Tim can probably speak more fluently, but in terms of how long you need to keep data for and so forth, 
we're not going to delete anything for you. There's no currently there aren't any limitations on on any of that, so you can keep it, all your historical data in here. Uh, the answer, by the way, about keeping data is for student transcripts, you need to keep them indefinitely, and I do mean indefinitely. Um, so you have to have a good scheme for keeping your student files because I, I continue 45 years after kids went to Barry to be shocked that I will periodically be reached by some national security agency or somebody who needs some piece of information on a child who was a student of mine when he was three or four years old way back when. So you do need to keep data. Does not have to be in the Montessori Compass system. It can be organized any way you can. You know you have to keep data secure. Rob has spoken in earlier seminars about everything they do to make sure your data and my data is really secure up here. Um, remember that probably paper files are more vulnerable, believe it or not, than online files because people break into school offices, get accesses. We get cases every month of some parent volunteer who's walked into a classroom where they're substituting and they manage to see things they have no right to see. Usually observation or progress notes on someone else's child. That's a breach of the Kellogg Act. You can't have this kind of stuff where people can easily get to it. So that's important. Um, there's another question someone is asking, which I think this is about the trackers. I'm not sure. Um, the asker is Sonia Jane, and it's, are these created by administrators? Sonia, hey, I'm guessing that's what she means. Okay. So a tracker um, is able to be created by a, an administrator or a teacher. So you can go in, anyone on the staff can go in there and create their own trackers. Trackers are, um, let me actually go into the live application to demonstrate this a little bit more clearly. Um, so I'm going to go on down to my trackers. And I'm going to go into... Um, so th these are all my different categories here. So let's go ahead and create a tracker, a tracker category. So we'll call this uh, Tim's Trackers. And do we want to share Tim's Trackers with parents, yes or no? We'll just say yes. So now we have Tim's Trackers here. Um, and now we add the individual trackers here. So we'll just say Tracker 1, you have an optional description. Trackers work by cycle years, um, much like the curriculum. So uh, that's done because you wouldn't want your upper L teacher to have to uh, sort through diaper changing trackers and stuff. So you can really kind of isolate where you want this to appear. If this is something that's, you know, strictly for the lower L classroom, I would go ahead and choose first, second, and third. If this is something that's relevant for the whole school, like this is something for the school administrator, uh, you know, a tuition agreement, a medical form, uh, things like that, you just choose all and it highlights everybody. So that means that all of the classrooms are able to view this tracker. Um, and then when you're done, you go ahead and create, and then you're all set. The tracker is now available. I can uh, go ahead and add another one, or I can go ahead and edit the existing tracker. Um, if I no longer need it, I can go ahead and delete it. So you have a lot of uh, flexibility here. You can also run reports on trackers as well. I could go into reports, and this is more of an administrative thing um, than it would be for the day-to-day -day, uh, items. But I can go into a trackers report. And I can go ahead and pick any of these categories here, enrollment forms, um, and see who's been tracked and who hasn't. So the emergency contact form, check. Health assessment form, check. Medical release, check, and so forth. So Maria has turned all this in, but the next student, Carly, she hasn't turned any of these in. So it'd be good for me to kind of uh, um, get with Carly's parents and go ahead and get this information in. I can print this information. I can also download it as a CSV file. A CSV can be opened in Microsoft Excel or any other spreadsheet application that you might be using. So you can see this is, you know, just a real clear at a glance how they're doing in this, you know, for the, in this specific track or category, and I can toggle between these. Because this information is also available in the individual student's uh, profile. 
I can click on the student's name, and now I'm viewing tracking trackers specifically for this one uh, student here. Um, I hope that answered the question. Any other uh, questions, Tim? Let me take a look. No, I don't see any new ones here. Well, 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 well yep, we got one or two. Um, let's see. Ian is asking, do you get charged for inactive or archive students? Um, and I, I'm, I, I'm actually muting myself every time Tim talks, so if there's a little delay, it's not because I'm not sure what I'm just going to say. I have to hit, hit the unmute button. Um, yeah, so we, we, we only charge, our billing structure is based upon active students. So you only pay for the students that are presently enrolled. You do not pay for inactive students. So inactive students would be anyone who's not presently enrolled. Maybe they're prospective students who have signed up for the fall, but they haven't started yet, or they signed up for next spring and you know you want to get their information in but they're not enrolled yet so you just list them as inactive. Um, archive students are former students who have moved on and we don't charge for those items. So only the students that are presently enrolled. Okay. Um, I think there's one other question here. We're a Montessori school that goes toddlers to third grade. We're voluntary participate in the Pennsylvania Keystone Stars Quality Initiative. We need to track our students online, and we currently use work sampling and ounce through Pearson. We would much rather align our efforts with Montessori all the way. Will Montessori ever become a vendor of choice? We are told we cannot use Montessori Compass until you apply to be a vendor. I did mention it to the foundation, and they seemed interested. This would be a huge leap forward to the relevance of monastery and accountability. Rob? Um, this is a great question for my uh, wife, Anita, who is presently fielding a, uh, a call from a customer right now. She'll be off in just a moment. I know that um, um, we've been contacted about this. I know we're in touch with the school. The person asking this question is probably that same school. Um, and I believe that you had a conversation with her about that. And I don't know the specific details myself, but um, when she gets back, she can definitely address that. I know we are interested in this, and um, I just can't speak fluently on it because I don't have all the information. Okay. We'll come back to that one. Uh, hang on just a second. I may have missed something. Stephanie Conrad. Um, hang on. I may have missed this since I had to join late, but are there trackers for social-emotional developmental milestones? I seem to remember that from a previous webinar, but I can't remember if it was in trackers or in progress reports. Do we load that ourselves like the other trackers? Okay, so yeah, your um, the trackers certainly can be for that purpose. The trackers can be for any purpose. I think the what you're thinking about is actually something we're going to be going over here with our progress reports, and that's our personal growth template, and that's something that is uh, a a component of the progress report that can be customized, and that's really for all of the non-academic um, types of information that you wish to assess a child. Um, are they working independently and, you know, do they uh, separate easily from the parents and um, all those sorts of assessments. Uh, we, we provide some templates um, by default and you can go ahead and customize those templates. Each classroom can have their own template that can be reused over and over again. And when we get a little further into the progress reports, I can go into greater, greater detail on that. Okay. Hang on. I think... Got some thanks, thanks, yes. I think we're now done with that. What do you think, Rob? Should I open up another poll? We're about one hour in. Sure. Okay, here's another poll. Hold on. So these are all just very simple things. Hopefully you can see it. And thank you all who are voting right now.
Looks like about 74% have voted, and I don't see any other people coming forward. So I'm going to close the poll, and I'll share the results. Hopefully you can see that. So, as you can tell, according to this, 31% uh, of us compare our notes in the central records for each child about, you know, periodically over the year. 22% of us do it once a month. 34% of us do it every week. 9% do it every few days. And 3% use a system that compiles it all for me. And if you use Montessori Record Express, I don't know what it does, but Montessori Compass does it for you. So if you're using it, it will do it for you every time. So the bottom line is, again, these software things, the tools, that's all they are. And they all do a lot. And it's just a question of what's the tool that you find easiest to use and that you find gets a job done in the least effort. Um, what I appreciate about Rob and Anita is every step along the way, as we've kibitzed from the outside, they've really listened and they've tried to be responsive to us. And I know to many of you who have been communicating with them as customers, telling them what you need and what you, what you feel should be changed. I'm going to close this up. And Rob, I'm going to hand it back over to you. All right, Tim. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to move on over to the progress reports. And um, so progress reports are really, really flexible. You can, um, we have schools that uh, do progress reports, you know, once a year, once a semester, every month, even, you know, every, every week or two. So all it really is is a tool that enables you to, uh, to display information to parents um, in a given um, time period. So... If you want to go ahead and share two weeks of data and uh, and go ahead and report upon that, you can certainly do so. You want to do it over the course of the semester, you can do that as well. So you give your uh, progress report a name. You choose your uh, your start and stop date. And then uh, someone had asked a question about the personal growth template. You would choose from a drop-down menu of pre-selected um, templates. You're able to modify those templates. But the idea is you modify those templates in advance, and then you have them set up, and then you can go ahead and uh, and uh, continue. Um, actually, before I get too in deep on the prompts reports, um, Anita's finished up with the customer here. Um, we had a question from somebody about the Keystone um, stars. I know you had a conversation uh, with the school about that. I did. And I said that you were the one that had some more information about that, and I thought that you might want to speak to that a little bit. Sure. Um, actually, can I get the is the question here, or is it possible to put the person on the microphone so I can? Or Tim, you want to translate the message again, or you well, can just <clears throat> put the person uh, hang, on hang on a second. Let me just find out which one it was. Put this. Uh, I've got to track back to find out which one it is. Uh, this was Leslie Delgado. Leslie, uh, would you like to get online? Tell you what, I'll go down and find Leslie and I'll put her online. Leslie Delgado, you are now online. Thank you. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Hi, Leslie. I'd be happy to, or, to answer any questions you might have regarding Keystone Stars. Well, what I was thinking was that I didn't ask this question to Montessori Compass, but I guess they did connect me to you from the foundation. This is Anita. I recognize your name. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, w yeah, we're just very, very interested in using Montessori Compass. It just makes sense. You know, we really don't want to continue using a vendor that's not really suited toward Montessori. Yes. Um, and we are, we, uh, 
definitely pursuing um, approval for okay. to become a, a, a licensed vendor. Um, so that's going to be a, a, a Tim and I have discussed this, and we're moving you know full 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 speed ahead with getting approved for the for the curriculum and assessment. Um, and then we'll be looking at other state uh, quality ranking programs as well in order to um, you know, be able to be a resource for other Montessori schools in other states as well. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, do you think it's going to be a long time frame? We have to actually um, do this yearly. You know, we have to, you know, get ready to pay again, I think, in October. And is that for the Pearson? Yes. Right. It expires every year. You know, every year you have to put in how many students you have and, you know, pay a fee. Um, but we we don't want to do things in, like, the middle of a year. We'd love to be able to start fresh, you know. Um, but we just didn't know what kind of time frame we'd be looking at or maybe it won't be till next year or if it would be sooner. Well, I'll have a better sense for that probably by the end of this week, and I'll be okay. sure to, to let you know. Thank Hopefully you. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay. So, Anita, I'm going to put Leslie back on mute. Anita, Rob, you still there? Yes, yeah. we are. Okay. Carry on. Um, we're Bye talking about progress reports and the idea that this is um, something that you could do uh, once a week, once a month, once a semester, once a year, whenever you want. It's really one of the real beauties of an online record keeping system is that, you know, you're not going to sort through reams of paper and notebooks and binders and trying to make heads or tails out of, you know, what, what your students are doing. It pulls everything up instantly and um, you can choose to share whatever you want to share with the parents. Uh, we're talking about the idea of the personal growth template, which can be customized to uh, include any information that you would like. And then you can also show, if you look here, there's different check boxes down here at the bottom. You can either show a summary tab or a more comprehensive tab, and you can also show the standards tab, which will include the correlation with the Common Core State standards, and that is an option that you have available. Um, can I say yeah, sure. Um, I just want to mention here that we actually go into depth and progress reports um, in the second session of this webinar series, and in this particular session, we're we're going to be mentioning progress reports as an additional tool for parent communication, kind of on a shorter scale. So we've had schools express to us that the daily and the weekly activity report doesn't doesn't really mirror what they are currently doing, and actually they do monthly reports, or maybe they do bi-monthly reports, or maybe it's every three weeks. So in this presentation, we're going over the concept of the flexibility of a progress report. So if the daily and weekly activity report time frame doesn't work, well, progress reports can be generated at any time for any set of dates and can be as robust or as kind of scaled back as you would, as you would like. So for example, on this screen, we've left out a personal growth template. You may want to only include that for your you know, very um, full progress reports that you do once or twice a year. And you can see in the date range, we've only chosen two weeks here to cover. And we've selected a legend template that's titled, you know, just a summary. And we're only showing one of the three options. In that very robust progress report that is published probably in the winter and in the spring, we may want to also include the standards and the summary and, you know, make it a more robust report. But for this sort of scaled back one, um, you can see the settings. So there are a lot of just options. Now, this is just showing um, the way we're gonna, we're, the legend can actually be used to include kind of a, of a summary of the report. So in this example, this is how a school might use this over the summer to report on the past two weeks. Um, it's kind of a summary blurb to describe what has been going on and maybe to give some sort of heads up for what to think about for the coming weeks or what to think about for next week. Um, and this is how it would look for parents. One of the updates we're going to make is um, the word legend is going to simply be notes. So you, in a large progress report at the beginning and middle of the year, you may want to use this to describe your assessment scales. What does presented working and mastered mean? Or if you're using other terminology, introduced, developing, um, you know, you tested, whatever you might use, you have a chance to explain that here. So if a parent is reading their child's 
in a report and assessments, they can go ahead and get a translation. So you could, but you could also use this tab, who's very flexible for anything, um, as a summary report as well. Now here on the teacher comments tab is really specific for the individual student. Any comments entered here are only seen by the parent of the particular student who you know, this report is for. Um, Rob, you can kind of take it over from here. Right, so you can comment, um, just kind of a general summary comment on how the child was doing in this uh, given period of time, again, whether it's two weeks or two months or the whole year. Uh, you can comment on the certain sections here, the certain areas of the classroom or categories. We only display the categories if the child had a minimum of one lesson. So if the child, you know, if we have art, music, and movement, geography, and so forth, if the child did not have any geography lessons in the given time period, geography wouldn't be on the list. We're only interested in letting the parents know about what the child has worked on, not what the child has not yet worked on. Um, and then you can go ahead and, and add custom comments on each one here. Uh, for, for the comprehensive tab, we really go into uh, give the parents a lot of information. As part as part of the scope and sequence, um, we provide a detailed description about what the category is. Um, in this case, we're looking at language arts, and you have a nice description here about what language arts is um, that would be cycle year appropriate here. I believe we're looking at a primary one right here. So the process of learning how to read should be as painless and simple as learning how to speak and so forth. Um, and this information can be customized. You can change this if you would like. But it gives you a good starting point um, to go ahead and um, this and this information can be shared with parents to help educate them. And again, anytime you have an opportunity to increase a parent's awareness or understanding about Montessori, that's, that's a really good thing. And there's a variety of ways to do that within Montessori Compass, this being one of them. Of course, you see the teacher note here that would be uh, specific to language arts in this case. And then you see the actual um, lessons and the corresponding elements. If you remember from prior webinars, that the elements are the measurable learning objectives. So the child worked with the metal insets. And she works with metal insets as presented, creating a single outline by tracing the frame. That's the measurable learning objective. And then she's currently at the level of presented. If she worked with the metal insets, uh, you know, six times over the course of this, this period here, um, we would only list it once, and we would list the current highest assessment level. So if she's currently at mastered, we would list it out as mastered. Um, so that's um, that's how you go ahead and you share this information with parents. And then we also have a more information link, just like we do in the um, activity reports, the daily or weekly summary of the child's day. In the progress reports, um, we also have that as well. And this, again, is where we um, you know, help to educate the parent alongside the child with including a parent-friendly description and an image um, on the corresponding material. Um, and so those are some of the communication aspects of uh, the progress report. Again, this is not a comprehensive overview of the progress report feature, which is a very large feature. Um, so we have a couple of questions here. Let's see. It looks like we could easily send a sensitive message to all parents when we mean to send it to only one parent. Is there a prompt to prevent us from making this mistake? So that's a good question. So. Um, you obviously need to be very careful um, when dealing with sensitive information and to double check this. Um, they, there are multiple ways of communicating with parents. So let me go into the application, I think. Um, I want to go into here and explain this. All right. So first way that we talked about was the idea of having the um, – oops. You go into my daily dashboard and you have your parent communication. So we can see that you have classroom observations and you have parent communications. Classroom observations are only viewable by the school staff. It says it right here. And it's a little different color here. This feature works much the same way, but you'll notice if I toggle on over the parent communication, you see the boxes are now yellow. And it very clearly states up here that this is what is viewable um, by the parents. 
and you obviously want to make sure that you're typing in, in, in the right box. You have the child's name and you have a photo. Um, so if I'm writing a note for Skylar, it you know should be a note for Skylar, not for Wendy. Um, and then the, the classroom box, that's the note for everybody. So that's just more general in scope. So, yeah, I mean, there obviously you need to be careful to make sure that you're writing in the right box here. If I'm sending out a message using our messaging system, which we spent a lot of time talking about this last week, you just need to make sure you have the right recipient. If this is a something for everybody, you choose all school, and now this message will be shared with everybody. Um, and if you'll see that there's even a confirmation. If I click send a message, it's even asking me to confirm because we recognize that you know it, a, a, a school can be a very busy place and there's a lot of distractions and there's a lot of movement and activity in the monastery classroom and in a monastery school in general. So you know we want to make sure that you want to send this message to all school. Make sure you've checked for typos and um, you know make sure you're sending it to the right place. Um, so you have that confirmation as well. So you just need to make sure that you're sending it to the right place and that you've uh, checked the confirmation here. Um, specifically related to the progress reports, you're just going to need to make sure that you're choosing the right progress report that you're editing here. It's very clearly labeled as to who you're working with. You see the child's name right up top here. Um, in the progress report. So as I'm going ahead and typing comment, it's, it's very clear as to which child that I'm working with here. Um, all right, so I think that was that question. There's a, uh, the questions are stacking up here, so I'm going to try to get to everything. Um, I'm on MC trying to find the templates for personal growth, and it appears blank. Um, Okay, if you can send us um, the name of your school, we can take a look at that. Um, if you're, um, there's a chance it could be, um, I'm not sure. Um, if their account is prior, if they create an account prior to that being automated. Oh, right. There was a period of time when that was not automated. So. All new accounts had them, but um, this might be somebody who's had an MC account for some time. So, yeah, for the person who asked that question, um, send Tim the name of your school and we'll, uh, we can contact you um, after the session. Our tracker is a one-time thing, meaning if I wanted to use trackers to track the number of, in of incidences, can I do that? So trackers can be a one-time thing, they can be a recurring thing. So in the case of uh, a toddler room with naps and diaper changes, that's probably going to be a recurring thing. Um, so, um, and in the case of a permission slip or a, you know, an enrollment form or something to that effect, those are going to be more one-time things. So you go ahead and, um, and um, you have the option to go ahead and, um, and, and view multiple instances on trackers. And in fact, if you go to reports, I was showing you the reports earlier. Um, let me go into reports. And we're going to click on the tracker report. And we'll go into, um, I don't know what this demo school has. So here's the maps here. We can see check marks here. But if I download this as a CSV file, it'll. Um, Let me go ahead and, or you know what, even if I print, well, do if I print it out? It might be easier to show. No, yeah. show me the check marks. If I download the CSV file, I need to, um, to go into another window of this. But if I download it to a CSV file, that should give me the number. So if she's been tracked as taking a, a good nap five times, I would uh, see the number five on the report. And here is the report right here. Um, so I had a great nap, and it says seven. I had a short nap. It says one and so forth. So it gives you the number of instances in which something had been tracked. All right, let's go check out the next question here. And let me see. Specifically, can trackers be used to track the number of instances a child has had each day or even just on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so yeah, it, it, like like I said, it, it's flexible in terms of um, you know whether or not you want to track something on an individual basis or just to check whether something's been done or not done, whether the enrollment form has been turned in or it hasn't. Those are kind of black and white issues there. You either have the enrollment form in your hand or you don't. Um, for uh, 
recurring um, things like naps and things like that, you see where it says tracked parentheses seven under the nap. So we've tracked her taking a nap seven times. So you have uh, flexibility there. Um, another question, the reason I update my records frequently is because I open them to my elementary students so my students can set their own goals. Does this program accommodate this? Um, Anita, maybe you can speak to this a little bit. Um, yes, it, it does. One of the nice features that we went over, um, I think it was in session number, the second session, um, for really any um, level, but, but really nice for the lower elementary, is the, is the lesson ideas tool. And with the lesson ideas tool, you can go into a student's records and um, add anything there onto their lesson idea list, and you can view that with them. You can add the lesson either with them next to you, and that would be here I am looking at a student's records. We only see her records right here, and we see in sequence um, lessons. We could go here and together go ahead and add some of these goals to her lesson ideas page, um, and then go ahead and choose uh, lessons from the mathematics category that we may want to add to our page. Any lesson that has not yet been um, mastered will have a little light bulb right to the right of it where you can go ahead and add things. Now, what's really quite nice about this is you can go straight to the lesson idea page and you can actually at the end of the week or the end of the day, however frequently you are documenting your student's lesson, um, come right here with them and Carly could come and sit with her teacher right here at the end of the week and, and go review the goals that they had put here earlier in the week. It can actually be printed out as well so they get a copy you have, um, you have it here as well. And then you can go ahead and see which ones she completed and send it to record keeping. And here are the elements, um, the measurable objectives, and you can go ahead and document the level, make any notes, and that gets removed from the ideal list and sent right into her record keeping. This can be quite nice when um, it involves something such as writing as well, where you can use the, um, the measurable objectives serve as an assessment rubric. So as you're reading Carly's piece of um, an opinion essay, you can look to see um, what actual level of writing is she reaching in terms of how well, how clear is the beginning and ending statements and linking opinion with reasons or um, facts and details being clearly linked and so on. Um, okay. When you enter a tracker description, where is that description used or displayed? Um, it's really just for internal purposes um, in the trackers um, as you're looking at them. It's not something that people use very frequently. There's no real um, benefit other than if you have multiple trackers that are similar names or something. It just gives you an extra way to kind of add some more clarity. But that's it. And there's no, um, no uh, recording benefit to it. We were able to squeeze an extra text box in there to give you some more flexibility, and we uh, always try to give you as much flexibility as possible. Mm -hmm. um, what about students who I need to input their past progress reports of last year before I start an MC? It requires me to put the dates, and I don't have those because the final report just states what level they are at. And their teachers have all left school. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, this thing just moved on me. Sorry, sorry. Um, no, it's okay. I got to get back up to it. the comment I was reading. Um, and where was I? Okay, and the teachers have all left school, and I will be starting with a new staff next year. Can I just put in the level of the child without dates? Um, you have to have a date to do record keeping, but if the date is not important to you in terms of the actual specific date, you can just choose any date. So if you're um, you know, you can go ahead and backdate as much as you want. Um, so if you have paper records or if you're moving from another record uh, keeping system and you want to enter in some past data for your, your students from last year or previous years, you can certainly do that. There's a number of ways to do that. I'll show you a couple of ways right now. Um, so the easiest way to do that, I think, well, one of the easiest, it's really a personal preference. Um, one of the easiest ways to do this would be the daily dashboard. It's kind of my answer for everything. 
um, the daily dashboard, um, if today is the 16th, I wouldn't want to do it today. I would want to do it in a day in the past. So maybe I do this on last Friday. And it's not very important to me what the date, or excuse me, what, what, what the date is. I just want to get the actual, you know, lesson in, and I want to get an assessment level in. So what I can do is go to record keeping, and I can do a search for whatever I'm looking here for here. And uh, so I can choose, you know, a lesson. Um, go ahead and choose, I don't know, um, I'm in the lower L classroom. Here, we're, choose a, a, an essay lesson here. So if I want to go ahead and document that a child worked with this last year, I can choose the corresponding uh, measurable objective here. And then if this is something that all of my students did or just a couple, I can just go ahead and um, multi-select or I can choose everybody or I can choose them by cycle year. Um, you know, and this is all being backdated. If I were to make everyone the same assessment level, I want to make everybody have two stars or the working level, I can certainly go ahead and do that by using the shortcut here. I can also go into the student's profile um, individually here. Let me get into Maria, and we'll go into records. And let's say I'm going to go through and I'm going to backdate the language area of the classroom. I'm a brand new Montessori Compass um, user, and I uh, want to go through here and just look at the scope and sequence and go ahead and backdate things. So here's the language area of the classroom, organized by the cycle year, or excuse me, organized in these subcategories here, and I could go right on down the list and add these. I can click Add, I can choose whatever date I want, and then go ahead and, uh, and actually record it right here. So this would be another way to do it. The, the benefit of doing this via the daily dashboard is that you can multi-select students. Um, this I have to do one student at a time, so that can be time consuming. You could also go ahead and do it this way. I can go into my, view my scope and sequence in its entirety here. And I can, again, I can go into the mathematics area of the classroom. And I can say, all right, we want to go ahead and do some backdating for our primary room. Let's go ahead and backdate the red and blue number rods for everyone who was there last year. Um, so I could go ahead and plan this lesson, or I can actually, excuse me, I could record this lesson as well. So I can plan to go ahead and do it in advance, or I could go ahead and record. So let me go ahead and use my search. I'm going to go back into the red and blue number rods. And I'm going to go ahead and click record this lesson. That will then also take me out to the daily dashboard. I can change my date, and then I can go ahead and record whichever students that I was working on um, and go ahead and, 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 uh, and uh, document that activity. Right now I'm in a different classroom. So there's a variety of different ways to backdate, um, and uh, it really just depends on what's the easiest way for you. But the key, the key thing is to find what you're looking for, put it on a date that is not today, that's a date in the past, and then um, you know, try to get as many students in there as possible by using the, uh, the idea of tagging multiple students. Um, did we do that one above it already? Yeah. All right. If you shared your administrator password with your teachers over the summer to allow them to input all the information relevant to their students in terms of their progress over their past years, once I know all the info has been put in MC, can I as administrator then change my password so that nobody can make any changes to this information? The answer is absolutely yes. You can change your, um, your uh, password at any time. You go into your profile. You can change your name. You can change your email. Uh, you can go ahead and change your password right here uh, to whatever you want. So just go ahead and log in. When, after you're logged in, you change your password and click update it, um, and now it's changed. Also, if you forget your password on the login page, there's a forgot my password link, and if you do that, that if you click on that, that'll effectively change your uh, password as well. It'll change it to something computer generated, some computer generated gibberish. Um, then you'll log in with that gibberish, and then you'll change it to something that you can actually actually uh, remember. So that would be how you can change that. And I think I've caught up on all the questions. Oh, there's any more? Uh, Keep them coming. There's one more. There's there's one more. There's you see the one that says, one that says, so won't, so there, be won't there be a discrepancy? Did I miss that one? Here, let me just, let me just I'll send it to you as a chat. Oh, I see it at the bottom now. So there won't be... 
a discrepancy if the lessons are all on one day that may fall on one day. Well, what we're talking about doing is backdating um, lessons from last year. Um, so because we can't, you know, there isn't any sort of a way to import um, all of the records, um, keeping in mind that the scope and sequence is going to be vastly different than what you were using in prior years. Um, you know, this, I mean, the lessons are going to be different. Um, you're not going to have the measurable learning objectives. So really what we're trying to accomplish um, with the idea of backdating the prior records is just to establish a baseline for a student that might be in the second or third year of a three-year cycle. So if we want to kind of establish that baseline, you can go into key areas of, the, of your classroom and go ahead and, uh, and backdate those records on, on an individual basis or on a group basis with multiple students. Um, so you just have to decide, you know, what, what is going to be the most useful information to get into the system and then go ahead and just choose a date, um, you know, from, you could even have a, have a temporary school year. If you're doing that over the course of the summer, you could create a school year that's just over the course of the summer and go ahead and get all that information in there and then go ahead and, um, and start a new school year when your school year starts in the fall. Um, am I making this clear? Did you want to add anything to this, Anita? I'm not sure if I'm making this clear enough in terms of backdating. Um, is there anything you think that might be uh, useful? Um, no, I think you're doing a great job. Okay. Um, if I'm not making that clear, please um, ask more questions. Um, all right, there's a couple more questions here. Also, our school days and weekends are changing next year. The country has changed it to be from Sunday to Thursday. Well, that's interesting. Um, so even if I place these lessons accurately from last year, they might fall on what I programmed in as a weekend next year. Will that create any issues? Um, I don't believe so. We haven't, we haven't come across that issue before. Um, but you can certainly have a school year that runs, um, a school counter that runs from Sunday to Thursday. That's not an issue. You can do that in the setup process. And for backdating, um, I, don't, I don't think that, that, that you would you know that, that it's useful to be concerned on what date it occurs. So you can, back, you can have your school set up to be a Sunday through Thursday school. Um, so that's your five-day um, five school week. Um, but with backdating, you're just trying to establish a baseline for the child's progress in a certain area of your classroom. You're not necessarily concerned with the specific date that it occurred. If it occurred, you know, last March or last October, um, that's less important than just getting the data in there. To have it be very precise would be very difficult to do and extremely time consuming. So, um, so just keep that in mind. Um, Students at my school have been there for several years. This is the first year, year we'll be using MC. Is there advice regarding backdating lessons previously presented in primary classrooms now that students are now entering elementary? It's really a personal choice if that's, if that's something that you feel is going to be useful as the child moves forward. Obviously, moving from paper to Montessori Compass or moving from a different system to Montessori Compass, there's there, you're going to have historical data that you can, um, you know, you can try to plug some of this in if, if you would like. You certainly are able to do that. Or you can just make a clean break this year and say, well, here's all my paper records from prior years, and we're using Montessori Compass for, for, uh, for new, new information that we're going to be, uh, going to be recording. So it's just, it all depends on how many students you're talking about, how many years of records you're trying to deal with, and what is what is going to be the benefit to to uh, you know to the student ultimately in the in in this coming school year and in the years ahead to have that data in there. So it would in a perfect world we'd be able to take all of that data, whether it's in paper or any other format, and get it in the system in some easy way. That's just simply not a reality due to the you know, just the vastness of the scope and sequence, how it's going to differ from what you were using prior, the number of students, and you know the format in which it was uh, it was um, it was recorded. So kind of cherry picking the the key areas of the classroom that are relevant, that are important for the for for the student. In this new year, important to the to the teachers that she or he are going to be working with, um, I think that those are things that you know you need to answer you know on a personal level as to what, what makes the most sense for your school. 
Um, okay. Any other questions? I know, Tim, we wanted to talk a little bit about our parent resources. Um, I can keep answering questions for as long as they keep coming. Are there any okay. others? Yeah, I got yeah, another I got one. Another one. <coughs> okay. Um, as for the teachers logging in with their own accounts, do they communicate with parents directly? Or can the admin look at it before? Look, can the admin look it over before they are posted, and are only posted by admin after the teacher's input? That's a personal preference. We give you a lot of ways to communicate. There's a lot of tools in the system, and you determine how you want to use them. Remember, there's no one-size-fits-all approach. In our communication center, you can determine how messaging is going to be used at your school. You can determine, do you want teachers to be able to message parents directly, yes or no? If you click no, then you need to have administrator level credentials to message parents. Do you want parents to be able to message other parents, yes or no? Do you want to enable a student directory, yes or no? So those are all um, features that you can go ahead and decide how you wish to customize those if, if you don't wish to have teachers um, message parents um, directly. You can also, for the daily dashboard and the parent communication comments here, let me go into my primary room. So as an administrator, I can go into here and I can see it if, you're, if you decide that you're going to use the daily or weekly activity reports and you decide that you want your teachers to go ahead and to use this for saying, you know, Maria had a great day, and you know, you can go in here and read every single one of these before they go out. Um, it really just depends on the personal um, preference of the school administrator, how you wish to run your school. If you want to set policies in place where these things need to be read before they go out, you can set a later time for them to go out. Um, what we do from our end in the software is, again, you can determine who can send out the messaging. You can also determine when these activity reports go out. So you can push this back to 9 p.m. if you wanted to, and then now they're going to go out at 9 p.m., which will maybe give you more time to go through and read them and make sure that everything is, is, um, is um, to, your, to your liking in terms of what the messages are being sent to parents. Um, so that's something that you, you're able to do. So there's a lot of flexibility in the ways, the ways to customize it. It just depends on how you wish to use it. Um, lastly, um, you can go into the student's profile, and you can you have historical reference to everything that's been sent out to the parents this way as well. I can go into here into parent communication. I can see all the correspondence. What I'm not able to see is the inbox of, of the teachers or or of the parents for that matter. I can't. If you grant your teachers the ability to message parents directly, then you know you just. You can ask them to log in and go ahead and, 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 and view it, but there wouldn't be a way for you to view it from your administrator account or to go ahead and approve things before they go out. Um, let, me let me jump let me in jump here. In here. <clears throat> we're, by the way, we're getting, we're getting a, a, an echo, an which echo, I assume has to do with you not using nine. earphones. Thanks. Okay. Um, in general, all of us have had the experience of a teacher really sticking your foot in in their mouth, and you've had to pay the price for something that a teacher wrote or said that came back to haunt you. My advice to all of us is to train our teachers properly. Get them real workshops in how to write narratives, how to write essays. Help them with their grammar. You need to also ask yourself if teachers can't write well, if they're not careful, why are they teachers? And if you've got teachers that don't have those skills, what can you as a school administrator do? Well, you certainly would want to micromanage them if you feel that there's nothing that's within your power. My general advice is trust. The simple fact is your teachers and anyone in your school can do you great harm anytime they want. They don't need Montessori Compass to do it. They know how to reach these parents. They know how to sabotage you by making a remark to a parent at the pickup line or calling them up at night or at a birthday party or some other activity where they happen to speak to each other. 
it's the old story of if you have a bird in the palm of your hand and you open your palm and the bird flies away and returns to you, then it's your friend. And if it doesn't, then it was never yours in the first place. I think it's so incredibly important to build our schools with people who are not simply placeholders, people who we trust, people who we respect, people who we like. Maria Montessori on this topic, as you probably remember, said, if a teacher doesn't know the great things of cultural literacy, if she doesn't know the stories of the great operas, of great literature, the ballet, if she doesn't herself have the skills, what has she got to offer a child? So a lot of this is emotional maturity. Some of it is just their own level of education. And a lot of it is emotional um, how, what kind of people have we gathered around us as our colleagues and our friends and our employees? So ideally, you're gathering around you the right people. We will be doing more workshops on how to write narratives. We will be doing things on how to build trust and community within your professional faculty between you as the head of school or the owner and your employees. But I think the general concept is assume that your teachers are better than what they may actually be. If you speak to the best within a child, you have the opportunity to bring that forth from the child. The same is true with our spouses and our friends and our employees. And that's my advice. So I wouldn't worry about it. I would certainly stress to my teachers this is important. Be careful. Be thoughtful. You can do great good and great harm. Don't do it casually. But I would fundamentally trust them because if they want to hurt you, they're going to hurt you anyway. Okay. I see another question that's come in, by the way. Question that's come in. I'll uh, forward it to you, Rob and Anita. Someone else, by the way, asked what the next webinar's topic's going to be. Okay, I'm, I'm back here. Um, so I'm looking at the question here. Uh, what is the most effective way for an administrator to see the student's progress on the system? Is that a different webinar? Uh, did, did I miss one? Or I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, all right, so. An administrator can go into a student's progress at any time. So we go back on over to the application here, and I can go into my student's um, list here. We'll click on Maria. We click on her records, and we'll go pick a category. In this case, mathematics. We'll choose a subcategory. And here's how she's doing in this area of the classroom. It's all listed out in sequence. So starting with the red and blue number rods, I can see that she's at uh, three stars. In our demo account here, we have presented, working, and mastered. You can, of course, change the assessment levels and the number of assessment uh, points in here. I can see the various times she's been, been uh, presented this material, and I could go through and do the same thing. I can go right on down the list here and see how she's making progress in this area of the classroom. I can also go ahead and view a number of other different uh, ways as well, such as timeline, which will give me uh, basically every lesson that's ever been reported for her, um, and uh, various other ways I can view how she's doing in the context of the Common Core Standard, um, how she's uh, progressing in various skill levels of presented, working, or mastered. A nice way, now that's kind of a, a doing it one at a time, and that's if you want to get really, really thorough on a specific student, kind of a nice bird's eye view, um, which is a relatively new feature that we have available, is our classroom progress at a glance. And we have a lot of uh, administrators who tell us that Montessori Compass is really their eyes and their ears. It's just obviously not possible to be in every single classroom, you know, all, you know, all, all through the day. So this is a nice way to really kind of keep track of that. So we can pick an area of the classroom like mathematics. The scope and sequence contains uh, 165 lessons in math for this particular classroom, which is the primary level. And I can see the number of lessons that presented and the corresponding percentages for each student in the classroom. I even get an average. So, um, you know, you can take that information and determine whether or not that's useful. 
you can then go take it to the next step here. I can now look at a subcategory, in this case, the decimal system 0 to 10. And now we've taken that down to nine lessons, and we can see how they're progressing. Again, a number of lessons and the, and the corresponding percentage, and then an average for everybody in the classroom. And if you have parallel classrooms, maybe you have two primary classrooms or four primary classrooms, and you want to see how one classroom you know, is making progress in comparison to another one. You could toggle between them, and that average would be a nice way to go ahead and do that. You can then now drill it down even further. We can take it to, say, the spindle boxes. Now we're at a specific lesson or material, and now we can see how everyone in the classroom is progressing with, um, you know, with this specific material. And then lastly, we take it to the lowest common denominator, and we choose the element or the measurable learning objective demonstrates an understanding of zero as an empty set and now we're as you know uh, as specific as we possibly can get here and we can see again how everyone is uh, is uh, progressing so that would be another way to go ahead and keep track of how everyone in your school everyone in you know per classroom or classrooms at a glance and so forth are making progress um, This question, we are new to MC and will begin using it for September. Do you have online tutorials for parents? Um, we get that asked that question a good bit. So the parents, um, we, we actually don't. And there's, it's not because we don't want to give you um, educational resources for parents. Um, it's that we have so much customization. And what we don't want is to put the school in an awkward position where, you know, parents realize that there's a lot more information that they could have access to, but they aren't getting. Uh, maybe, you know, you've chosen to use weekly reports, and they realize that they can do daily reports. And, you know, th so there's, there's no real easy way, because there's so many different ways to modify it to work the way that you want it to work. There's not a real clear way for us to convey that to parents. I will say that it's extremely intuitive. Your parents are all, you know, uh, the overwhelming majority of them are going to be smartphone-toting parents that are using Facebook and email and, you know, text messaging and all that sort of uh, stuff. This is not going to be something that's going to be difficult for them to figure out. Um, they're also consuming information. They're not entering data. They're consuming. They're looking at photos that you shared with them, or they're reading a progress report that you shared with them, or a message, or looking at a shared calendar. So they're, they're at the consumption level, whereas you know a school administrator or a teacher have a lot more to be concerned about and a lot more things to learn and to master. So, so that's why we actually don't provide tutorials for parents. Great. Um, <clears throat> Is there a way to add or eliminate lessons or topics that are not that are are not part of the original Montessori compass scope and sequence? Um, so the curriculum is a big topic. Uh, we covered that in another session, and uh, real quickly here, you can um, view the entire scope and sequence ranging from infant through age 12. Here, you can go into any of these categories here and to you know take a real good look at them. Anything that you don't wish to use, you are able to archive. Archive does not permanently delete. It just removes it from your lesson planning and your record keeping. Um, you can edit things as well, make changes, and you can also add lessons. So if there's um, aspects of a certain part of the classroom that are not in there that you wish to add, you may certainly do so at any time. If uh, there are entire categories, maybe you... Um, have a language program for French or Spanish or Latin or a special music program or any other sorts of programs here that maybe are outside of our scope and sequence, you can create a whole new category and you can get that information in the system as well. You can also contact us and we can help you to import that automatically via a spreadsheet. You need to follow a very specific format. We can share with you a sample format and we can import curriculum for you if you wish. Um, see if there's any other questions. Did I miss one here? There was one that, um, one that uh, Manal, Manal said, which said, has, which to, has do, to do, uh, she'd love she'd to, love um, to, uh, to trust all to her trust teachers, all but, teachers there's always, but there's always the worry with the worry new people. With the new people. 
Oh, sure. I mean, as 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 uh, Tim said, I mean, we, we we put as as many safeguards into the system as we're able to. Um, but you know, ultimately, it is going to be a, uh, a a decision that the head of school needs to make as to how you wish to move forward with parent communication, and then um, you know who you trust to go ahead and do that and put firm policies in place. And remember, I mean, it's the school who's paying for the program, and you certainly can um, you know let uh, let let teachers know that you you have the right to check their messages and you know check their accounts and so forth. I mean that's very common and you know with a lot of big corporations that your emails monitored and things like that. So that that that's not uncommon stuff. And you know so you have it really depends on you know what, what, how you how you want to do things. But from our perspective, we provide a lot of different tools, a lot of ways to customize it, and you do what you want with it. You know however you see fit. Sounds good. Sounds good. Tim, um, wanted to go over um, a little bit. I know we're getting short on time here, mm-hmm. but the, the parent resources section, we're hoping you can speak to this a little bit. This is an area that we're in the process of developing, and um, there's going to be both a parent resources page and there's going to be a teacher resources page. And the type of content that you're going to have available, if I can get into here a second, Anita, um, is to um, – no, I want to get into um, – over here. Um, so here's um, the current parent resources page. There's not a whole lot to look at right now. We're in the process of developing this, but the foundation has uh, very generously made available digital um, access to Tomorrow's Child magazine for parents. Um, and on the teacher side, um, access to Montessori Leadership um, magazines. This is a really nice way to go ahead and um, and just get parents to be more, become more engaged with Montessori and gain a much greater understanding. Get this nice um, kind of digital magazine viewer here. So we're going to have access to that in addition to a variety of other educational content that Tim can probably speak to a little bit in terms of videos and Montessori 101 type content available for parents and then other resources that will be of interest to teachers. Yeah. yeah. We're planning, We're planning to, to do quite a few do things. Quite a few things. So why don't you so mute yourself? There, thanks, Rob. We're planning to do quite a few things. Um, we're going to have, uh, of course, our own videos. We're going to put links to videos that we select that are created on YouTube by other really interesting people. Um, we have lots and lots of video equipment here at the Monastery Foundation and at our lab school. And I'll be doing things like interviewing kids who will explain to you how to do specific lessons, and then we'll post that online for parents. Um, obviously, I'll just do some cinema verite of classrooms at work, and I may add some narrative, whatever. We're going to be doing uh, webinars, all sorts. The kind of thing that we're doing right here will continue for people who are part of Montessori Compass. Right now, we're reaching out beyond the membership of the International Monastery Council and subscribers to Monastery Compass, but our plan is to use Monastery Compass as a container, a virtual community. And we're going to be holding parenting classes, one-off webinars uh, on different aspects like planning for college or dealing with a uh, sassy uh, brother-sister combo that someone sometimes you get or having guest speakers speak about issues on brain research or whatever. So think of it as a video blog, and you'll be seeing that kind of stuff as well. Uh, Monastery 101 will be in here very shortly, which is our introduction to Monastery. That's the next issue of Tomorrow's Child. And for those of you who still really prefer paper, your parents will get both. And what I'm noticing at this stage in life is, The average parent doesn't want to just read things on their iPad. They like that, but they really want a piece of paper. So those are both available. So by the time we're done, I think um, there will be an awful lot of resources that will add yet a whole different layer of, of value to what has been created in this collaboration between the Monastery Foundation and, uh, and Monastery Compass. So I think that's it, Rob.
Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to unmute again there. But there yes, uh, thank you very much for everyone uh, joining us here today. Very, uh, very happy to have you here and taking the time uh, yet again. Oh my goodness, we still have, of course, more questions. And since there aren't, most of our hardcore people are still here. We've had 98 questions today. Rob, people are asking about contracts, paper contracts between kids and their teachers. Kids and their teachers. And um, con yeah. Okay, am, am I understanding that? Are you talking about a contract between a, a what? A work plan. Work plan. Work plan. Oh, a work plan. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, you want to speak to that, Anita? Sure. Um, hold on a second. That, uh, so the lesson ideas page is um, one suggestion that we have right now. It, uh, it can be printed out. Um, and it's not tied to any particular date, and so you can just put lessons on there. We are working on developing um, a more kind of fully featured work plan, but we do not have that right now. The lesson ideas um, function is really the closest that we have. And I'm getting a lot of, questions, a lot of questions, about questions about a Montessori, Montessori concept app. app. Um, so, um, yeah, people ask us about apps all the time, and um, we developed this system with touchscreen devices in mind. Um, our, this system was uh, developed from the ground up with tablets and you know, iPads and phones and all that in mind. So it works beautifully in any web-enabled device, um, specifically. Uh, I'd say probably more than half of our schools are probably using iPads or Android tablets in the classroom, so it's uh, very touchscreen friendly. You have access to the entire application. It's not like a limited mobile app that maybe can do a couple of things but can't do everything. So um, you, at this point, there's no need for a mobile app. We are considering building an app in the future in terms of uh, making some of the parent communication features a little bit easier to use, but we don't have a firm timetable at this. But for the record keeping and the you know, classroom management type of stuff, um, the, um, it works really, really well just on, a, um, you know, on, on, on your phone or your tablet. Um, what a lot of parents do, by the way, just to kind of a, something you can tell your parents, is to is just to keep Montessori Compass open on a tab. If you're using an iPhone, keep it open on a uh, on, on a tab in Safari. If you're using an Android, keep it open on a tab in Chrome, and then just go ahead and refresh it from time to time, and you'll see all the latest stuff. And uh, you know, same goes for your staff. You can always have it open there. Um, so that's a something to consider doing. But it works very well on touchscreen devices. Good. Good. So, so our last, our last seminar, seminar in the series is going to be next, next Friday, Friday, 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And when I say next Friday, I mean in three days. So, among other things, we've got to get an invitation out right away. Uh, people, have uh, people have asked about the topic. The topic? Yeah, the end, uh, yeah we're, we're going to be focusing on uh, some of the more... Um, administrative uh, tools in the system. So that will be uh, the bulk of our focus for Friday. There you go. So I want to thank everyone for staying. I really appreciate it. I know it's very late at night for those of you who are outside of the United States, and we have you all over the world. Um, we'll sign off for this week, and I'll get the recording online as quickly as I can. Thanks very much. This is uh, the Monastery Foundation's uh, Monastery Leadership Institute. And I want to thank you for, for participating in our fourth webinar on uh, making Montessori Compass work for your school.